Well, and a fine good day to you, my subscribers. It's Russ Barkley, back again with your weekly research review. I'm sorry we're about three days behind here, but as you know, I was creating four videos, dismembering and criticizing the New York Times Magazine article about ADHD and medication. Hope you had a chance to enjoy those. Uh, but today, which happens to be Tuesday, uh, we're going to start again, as usual, with some dad jokes. These come to us from the website, thepioneerwoman.com. Imagine, I'd really never heard of it till I'd Googled dad jokes, but here we go. They're, they're pretty good, a, a bit sexist in some cases, but that's the way it goes. Right, let me try to shut down a few of these ads, which we all find so bothersome. Okay, here we go. How do you stop a bull from charging? You cancel its credit card. <laughs> All right, here's when I had a little trouble understanding myself, but I think I eventually got it. Am I the only man my wife has ever dated? Unfortunately, yes. She said the others were all nines and tens. Mm, kind of a stretch there, but uh, here's a funny one for you parents out there. What's the difference between a man's wallet before and after kids? There are pictures where the money used to be. <laughs> All right, one last one. Uh, and oh, Don't yell at the messenger here. I'm just passing this along. But here's your fourth and final joke. I haven't spoken to my wife in four years. I thought it would be rude to interrupt her. All right, let's move on quick before I get shot. We've got six articles to talk about this morning. A uh, little bit more than before because I waited so long to get this research review done. But... Here we go. The first one actually comes to us from my good friend, Brooke Molina, who is at the University of Pittsburgh and Western Psychiatric Institute. And this is the uh, partly the results of a follow-up study she's been doing following several hundred children with and without ADHD, a little over 300 with and 223 without ADHD from childhood into adulthood. And in this particular study, Brooke is looking at the predictors from childhood and adolescence for alcohol use problems and heavy alcohol use in adulthood. And what she found is that besides the severity of ADHD symptoms and its persistence, which we have always known is related to heavier alcohol use, or at least excessive alcohol use in young adulthood, she also found several other predictors. One was poor academic performance. No surprise there. The worse people were doing in school, the more likely they were to turn to using alcohol excessively by adulthood. So uh, that was an interesting one as well. Uh, she also found that the degree of social support and impairment experienced across the longitudinal study also was a predictor. So the more socially impaired an individual was and the more poorly they did in school, particularly in their ultimate educational attainment, the greater was the likelihood that they would turn to heavier or excessive alcohol use by adulthood. They didn't find anything that really predicted uh, very heavy alcohol use problems in adulthood. So something else is going on there. And interestingly enough, she didn't find that degree of antisocial behavior or delinquency in adolescence was related to alcohol use in adulthood. Other studies have suggested that those two are related to each other, but Brooke finds that once you take into account the lower educational attainment and greater social impairment in these individuals with ADHD, those are what are really accounting for people turning to heavier alcohol use or excessive alcohol use, excuse me, by young adulthood. So a fascinating longitudinal study there by uh, Dr. Molina on predictors of alcohol use in adulthood and those with ADHD. Moving right along, my next paper comes to us from the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology. Uh, it's actually a study out of Sweden, and it's looking at individuals who have had heart attacks, in this case, acute myocardial infarction. And it's using, of course, the very large database from uh, Sweden uh, and looking at healthcare in these individuals. And they found several hundred individuals, uh, excuse me, it was actually 3,200 individuals that had acute myocardial infarctions. Then they went back and subdivided them 
into those who had a diagnosis of ADHD and those who didn't. So we're starting with heart attacks and then we're going to carve the group up into those with and without ADHD and see whether having ADHD affected the clinical course and outcome of these individuals. And what they found is that those with ADHD were much more likely to be smoking, <clears throat> about, let's see, 50% more likely to be smoking. They also found that they had other substance use difficulties uh, and that these individuals found it harder to quit smoking, also did not participate in follow-up evaluations reliably, no surprise there, uh, and that the individuals with ADHD had a higher rate of all-cause mortality following their first heart attack. They didn't necessarily have a higher rate of subsequent heart attack, they just had a higher rate of all-cause mortality. Well, we know that already, if you've been listening to other videos on this channel, that adult ADHD predisposes to a greater risk of early mortality, primarily related to the impulsivity that leads to risk-taking, accidental injuries, possibly suicide attempts, and so on. So again, this study kind of, I think, repeats or replicates earlier evidence about all-cause mortality, but it shows us that someone with ADHD who has a heart attack is going to have a more difficult time following the heart attack with quitting smoking, adhering to recommendations for treatment plans, and follow-up evaluations. Okay, thought you might be interested in that one. Our next paper up, uh, excuse me, is going to be on sex differences in ADHD, and this comes to us from a population in Spain. And this is a study that compares a large sample of adults with ADHD comparing men versus women in their outcomes. Now, the study hasn't been published yet, but it will eventually be over in the journal European Psychiatry. And what they found in comparing these 900 adults diagnosed with ADHD based on their sex is that the females with ADHD reported significantly greater problems with ADHD itself. They had higher levels of depression, greater levels of anxiety, a lower level of substance use than the males, and overall poor psychosocial functioning. This kind of reiterates what people have been suggesting in earlier studies of girls and women have suggested that women are more impaired by ADHD even if they are at the same level of severity of ADHD, but this study suggests that they may even be more severe in their ADHD, at least within the Spanish population. Now, I didn't see anything here about criminal activity or other risk-taking behaviors such as driving and so on, where we know that males with, that, uh, with ADHD engage in those activities more than females do. But it does suggest, or at least reiterate, what we had seen in U.S. studies, which is that women with ADHD had more depression and more anxiety, but weren't using substances to the degree that the men were. But overall, poor psychosocial functioning. So uh, women with ADHD are clearly impaired and may even be in certain areas more impaired and have mo more comorbidity for anxiety and depression. Okay, next up, we're going to be exploring the shared genetic basis between ADHD and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, as you know from my earlier videos, ADHD is associated with a variety of sleeping difficulties in children and adults. And one of those sleeping difficulties that we see more often is obstructive sleep apnea. And so here we have a study looking at the genetics of both disorders. And it's using two databases of tens of thousands of individuals. I'm just going to scan down here and read this to you because we're looking at data with regard to ADHD on nearly 39,000 individuals with ADHD compared to about 187,000 controls. And when it comes to sleep apnea, they're gonna be looking at the genome scans of nearly 44,000 individuals. 
and over 367,000 controls. So some very big databases being used here, and they're looking at the risk genes that may be shared between these two disorders. And what do they find? They find that do doesn't matter which way you go, if you start with ADHD, you have more genes for obstructive sleep apnea, so that the genes for one are related to the genes for the other. And if you go the other way, okay, if you happen to have sleep apnea, you have more genes for ADHD as well. In other words, there is shared genetics between these two disorders that helps us to explain why people with ADHD may be more prone to sleep apnea among other sleeping difficulties. The bottom line is it's probably shared genetics. So thought you might appreciate that study that comes to us from the journal uh, progress in neuropsychopharmacology and biological psychiatry. As always, as you know, I put the links to these articles in the description in case you want to follow up and read the abstracts yourself. Sometimes you can't read the whole article because it's behind a paywall, but you can at least find the paper and its abstract. Okay, next up is an interesting study that comes to us. This one out of China. And it's a randomized trial assigning teens with ADHD to either an exercise program or to simply being followed up over a 12-week period of time. This comes to us from the International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity. So these authors took 88 teens with ADHD, split them into two groups, and one group got an hour a week of aerobic exercise for 12 weeks, and the other was simply followed up over time. So a no treatment control group, if you will. And the authors found that those who had the exercise group were significantly better and more improved in areas of depression, anxiety, stress, and even in inhibitory control. Interestingly, there were no differences between the groups in levels of subsequent aggression. They also found that the group that had the exercise program showed higher ratings of resilience, psychological resilience, than the control group did, but that didn't last through the follow-up period. So overall, yet one more study suggesting that physical activity done on a regular basis is beneficial for people in coping with their ADHD and related disorders. So nice paper there as well. My final paper is going to be in my PDF over here. So let me just bring this up and expand it for you. This is a meta-analysis looking at the retinal structure in the eye of people with neurodevelopmental disorders, specifically ADHD and autism. And they're looking at studies that were done that use optical coherence tomography, kind of a CT scan of the eye. And they're gonna look at the thickness of the macular layer in the retina. They're also gonna be looking at the uh, thickness of the optic nerve fibers and the ganglion cell layers in the eye. So I know it's getting rather technical, but I still find it fascinating. Uh, the results that they found, seven studies were included in the meta-analysis, including more than 285 individuals with ADHD, 340 individuals with autism spectrum disorder, and 650 typically developing control individuals. And what they found in their meta-analysis is that those with ADHD had more thinning of their retinal nerve fiber layer and had less uh, thickness of their ganglion cell layer. So let me just double check that to be sure. Yep, that's what they found. So uh, in any case, that was compared to the TDCs, the typical developing individuals. They did find that those with ASD also had some thinning of their retinal nerve fiber, but no other differences. And neither group seemed to have any problems with macular thickness. So yet another paper showing that there are problems uh, with not just vision, but in this case with the retinal structure in those with ADHD compared to 
a typically developing control group. All right, everybody, that's your research for the week. Sorry I was a bit late, but I was tied up with other matters trying to address the propaganda from the New York Times Magazine. Uh, so please forgive me for that. I'll try to get back on time this week with our research reviews. As always, thanks for joining me for this week's research roundup. As I often say, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now. Thanks, everybody.